Good morning, and I'd like to thank you all today for coming. As you know, I am MPP Teresa Armstrong, and I am pleased to be joined by Katrina Alkami, parent of a child at Robart School, Lalita Tamburi, parent of a child at Robart School, Donald Prong, Ontario Association for the Deaf. You will hear from each of them on this important issue momentarily. I also want to re recognize that that here in the audience today is Annette Sang from the Decoding Dyslexia Ontario, Elaine Keenan, President of International Dyslexia Associations Ontario Branch, Erwin Elman, the Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth, along with many concerned parents and children from the provincial and demonstration schools throughout the province and my riding of London Fanshawe. We are here today because the Ministry of Education is responsible <clears throat> for the provincial and demonstration schools which provide specialized supports for deaf, blind, deaf, blind and or severely learning disabled students. These schools are often a last resort for parents and families which several of the guests here will attest to. Consultations are taking place at Robart School for the Deaf as well as all English language demonstration schools for students with severe learning disabilities. Two of these schools are in my riding of London Fanshawe. My constituents in London as well as students and families from across Ontario have inundated my office with emails, phone calls and letters attesting to the benefits of these schools for students with severe learning disabilities. Parents and students enrolled at Robart School for the Deaf continuously praise the option to immerse their children in an ASL environment. This government is threatening to take these options away from students and leave families with nowhere else to turn. During the consultations process, enrollment for the next year has been suspended. Teachers who are passionate about their work at these schools now face an uncertain future and many have no choice but to return to their home school boards. Dedicated educational support staff worry that they will be out of a job and that the students will be sent back to boards without supports to allow them to succeed. The government has turned their back on families that have poured thousands of dollars and hours of their time into preparing their applications. This is the same government that cut special education funding by 30 at 38 school boards in 2015 and began by announcing an additional 430 million cut in 2016. The government claims that these consultations are not about saving money and yet their actions reflect what's laid out in the Drummond Report, which is only about money. The government claims that these consultations are in the best interest of students, but fail to assure students that their schools won't be closed as a result. The, clo the closure of these schools next year will leave students and families with nowhere else to turn. The government refuses to answer whether or not schools will close as a result of consultations. The closure of these schools will leave students and families with nowhere else to turn. New Democrats, concerned parents and children and advocates call on this government to unfreeze applications for the next year and commit to keeping these specialized schools open. I'd like to turn it over to um, Katrina Alkami. Um, to, uh, you know, speak about her personal experiences with her son, um, Omar, and, um, and uh, you know, make this government pay attention to how these things are affecting real lives of real people and uh, real students who are coming to these schools for help. Thank you, Katrina. Good morning. Um, as she said, my name's Katrina El Shami, and my son Omar is a student at Amethyst Demonstration School in London. He is here in the audience with another student, Becca. As early as JK, Omar had an IEP due to speech. He had no speech when he went to kindergarten. In grade three, he was put into a SIR classroom with eight children and special education teacher. By grade six, he still could not read and was severely behind in all subjects. At that time, the Band-Aid was a computer as an accommodation, but no remedial intervention was done. 
In a chance encounter with another parent, I heard about Amethyst. We applied, we went through the process, it's a year long, and we were accepted. In the two years he has been there, he has excelled going from a grade two to grade seven reading level and working at grade level in all other subjects. His confidence and self-worth have skyrocketed. Most of the children's stories began like Omar. Our change.org petition has produced over 80 pages of comments filled with inspiring stories of life-changing education that the demonstration schools have provided. We have heard over and over again from the ministry that there is a growing evidence that students with learning disabilities can be successfully supported in district school boards. What is meant by supports and where is the evidence? The fact is the school boards have nothing in place with regards to helping these children with systematic explicit instruction. They are ill-equipped at best. School boards have not been able to address the issue of severe learning disabilities. However, there has been clear efficacy of the programs at the demonstration schools since the late 70s. The Ministry of Education has systematically over many years sought to disband the provincial schools by capping enrollment at 40 students and not allowing the schools to market their services, giving the impression of low enrollment. Demonstration schools are always filled to capacity with first year students that stay for a second year as well as incoming applicants. Students are allowed two years maximum at the demonstration schools. The ministry has started a consultation at the very time when the application process, which has now been halted, was due to wrap up and planning for the next year is to begin. The ministry gave parents and stakeholders very little notice that these consultations were taking place. Why has the secretarial position for the Provincial Committee on Learning Disabilities not been replaced after vacating her position last year? The stopping of the application process has devastated the hopes of many young applicants. Teachers are having to make decisions under duress because the timelines are so short and coincide with their decision as to their placement for next year. The teachers and staff have to apply back to their boards by April 1st and the online survey ends on April 8th. No students coming in and no teachers there to teach. There will be no one to occupy the school for September 2016. The ministry has concocted this consultation process as lip service in an attempt to deceive parents. We are not fooled. The consulting firm they hired is a market research firm with education expertise in post-secondary education market institute placement. Severe learning disabilities and the associated delivery model is a lot more complicated than market share. The Ministry of Education needs to be proactive and not reactive. The budget for these schools is a mere drop in the bucket, taking up less than five one hundredths of a percent of the $23 billion budget. The cost to the system and to society will be far greater if these kids are left in the regular school system. Many will drop out, have increased risk of mental health issues, face unemployment, and increased risk of entering the correctional system, which is taxing our social services more. In 2012, the Supreme Court of Canada made an articulate and powerful statement that adequate special education is not a dispensable luxury. For those with severe learning disabilities, it is the ramp that provides access to the statutory commitment to education made to all. Ontario is leading the nation with regards to this ruling. With our demonstration schools, we have, clearly, we have a clearly successful remediation program. The data is strong on the competency and drastic results of the programming of the demonstration schools. Students are given the opportunity to succeed and be productive citizens and can now go into the world empowered and ready for the world. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Um, Next we have um, Lalita Tamburi and she's going to speak about uh, her experience and with her children, her child. Hello, thank you. My name is Lalita Tamburi. My daughter Jaya Ketnes, my daughter Jaya's hearing loss was detected at almost three years of age despite our efforts in taking her for a six plus hearing test to our top audiologist. In the end, after our insisting that there was a hearing issue, our ENT had a sedated hearing test done and the answer was evident. 110 dB loss in one ear and 90 dB in the other. She is almost completely deaf. We went to speech therapists and accessed all the resources we could get our hands on for her in the hearing preschool before we had the official test result, but still no language. 
They even tried bringing ASL into the preschool, but there was almost no progress. Without confident, positive role models in ASL, we didn't see any progress in terms of her language acquisition. We quickly realized that it wasn't easy to enroll her in a deaf school. We had to apply to have her admitted into a regular hearing school, and then after that we had to ask to have her transfer, transferred to the school for the deaf. When I met with educators from my daughter's home school, they were surprised that I even knew about the deaf school and that we had already made our decision. They are not allowed to recommend the school, but because we knew about it, they had to comply. From there, we applied and we waited. I would call from time to time and check in, but apparently the admissions council for provincial, provincial schools don't meet that often. It was, a very, it was a very stressful and it felt like they didn't want her in the school. Imagine a deaf school not wanting a deaf student. It was a confusing, stressful, and a mind-boggling time, that's for sure. We received our notice that she was accepted to the school towards the middle of May when she was due to start school in September. It is obvious that she's excited to go to school now to see her friends, teachers, and her community of peers. Since our daughter has started at Robart School for the Deaf, her communication is flourishing right before our eyes. Yes, she is still a typical four-year-old, defiant at times, but she is able to understand our expectations and then choose not to cooperate. cooperate. Before attending Robart School for the Deaf, we were uncertain if she was even understanding the expectations, leaving every interaction very confusing on both ends. There was so much frustration before she started at Robarts, and now there is so much less. All the parents are devastated at the thought of the school closing. We see how much the school is helping our children to be the best that they can be in life, how it's helping them to build a strong identity, to build communication skills, and, and learn from those who know best how to live as a deaf minority in a hearing world. These kids need to be educated in ASL as this is their most natural way of expressing, connecting with, connecting with and understanding the world around them. The kids get everything they need in this school, both social and academic. There is such a buzz around integration right now, but for some kids, this is not the solution. Mainstream schools are not an option for some deaf kids. I have been sent some letters from deaf and hard of hearing and people who have done part or all of their education in mainstream school. Here is a little of what they have expressed. This is Rose Etheridge. My ASL English interpreter actually became the only person in the entire school who I could really talk to. She was the only person in the entire school who knew who I was, what I believed in, my likes and my dislikes my personality, my thoughts, and so on. And this is Angie Cussworth. I can tell you that while I did okay academically, I always felt socially awkward. Even with hearing aids, hard of hearing people do not hear everything. Therefore, we miss out on things. We get left behind. Our peers get annoyed at having to repeat things for us. And this is from a, a person who wishes to remain anonymous. Teachers were always frustrated with me and yelled to my face thinking that if they talk louder, I would hear, or if they get in my face, I would understand better. So you can clearly understand that integration in the mainstream isn't good for everyone. The other two options we will have if the school closes are to send our children to school and stay in residence at E.C. Drury School for the Deaf, or to uproot our family and move to Milton. Truthfully, none of these are good options for our families. We feel as parents that the answer isn't to close the schools, but to open them up willingly to all those who would benefit from the bilingual ASL English curriculum and to create an open sharing relationship with mainstream schools, inviting hearing kids to the deaf schools, not the other way around. We are begging for our schools to stay open. 90% of deaf kids are born to hearing parents. The Deaf schools are their lifeline to language, education, and identity. Thank you, Alita, for that. Um, now we're going to have our last panelist speaker, um, Donald Prong from the Ontario Association 
um, for the deaf. Thank you, Donald. Thank you. The comments and personal stories shared among the panel. Ontario Association of the Deaf echoes the same stories. However, it, uh, many of the experiences are quite similar. And a concern that, that lies with us is in relation to the government. And any time they release a review of government funding, we instinctively know that change will happen. And we understand that it's not usually a minor change. And are people typically comfortable with change? No. People are comfortable with the status quo because they understand what works best. Within our community, parents, deaf children, deaf adults, deaf alumni, these are individuals who have graduated in the mainstreaming education system and have shared their stories with us. They are not happy with these changes. They're very unhappy with the way the provincial government has been running and working very hard to shrink our deaf community based on assimilation. They've engineered this plan for a number of years and they're trying to come up with ways and not keeping us informed, not keeping the parents informed, trying to get the numbers smaller and smaller to make decisions about the ASL environmental schools. And they have made these changes with an ulterior motive. And I've called this an engineered plan. This is quite disappointing to us. <coughs> February 2018, the Ministry of Education has released information online. February 18th, the government released, no. the government released information to the public on their website. It was a discussion paper. And guess what? From this particular discussion paper, it was a specific consultant who drafted it. And of course, we're getting only one side of the information. There was no public consultation done before this recommendation was made. There was a lot of um, gaps in information, which is quite concerning to us. The discussion paper addressed two points, the low enrollment numbers and the quality of education. This is quite concerning. Because the low numbers of enrollment, we have to look to who is responsible for this, and ultimately it is the Ontario government. The quality of education, well, that goes hand in hand with the low numbers of enrollment, so therefore lower access to quality education. Now, right now, as, as I have spoken with a, a panelist about their daughter, they're in grade one. Now, what happens if you have, say, 10 students in one grade? Ten students will not learn from the teacher only. They learn from their peers. They, they acquire in a, in a dynamic environment through their peers as well as their education. So it's imperative that they come up with all of the right information. Helen Keller, a very famous author who was deaf and blind, she grew to be very successful because she had the right educator, Anne Sullivan. She was very specialized in her skill in working with Helen to allow her to develop ASL skills, written language skills, and oral skills. And we want to thank the Ontario government for providing a sc the schooling in Ontario that they have for deaf children. And the teachers in the deaf education system, I, I equate to Annie Sullivan in her specialty and her skills. So in order to close these schools, do the school boards have the same qualified teachers to fulfill these gaps? The research and the evidence is there that the children are falling through the cracks within the education system. The Ontario government and their plan would appear that they just want to place the children in the school boards, but do they have the right teachers? Do they have the right qualifications? Are they prepared? Last week I came across a job posting within a school book school board for a teaching assistant position to work with deaf children. The minimum qualification for that particular position is high school level. There was no acknowledgement of skill in American Sign Language. And this is just one of several examples that we have seen happening. And children going to the high school level and graduating and then working with our deaf children to help them succeed, that's considered cruel. 
So again, I want you to think again. We are more than happy to work with you. We would like to try and figure out the best possible solution here. Thank you. So I just want to wrap up by um, <coughs> thanking everyone for um, you know, sharing their life experiences and their stories with us and all the panelists and everyone here today who's come out to support us and to send that message to this government that uh, these schools need to stay open. They, they really meet the needs of students with specialized, um, the, the specialized schools that provide the services that children choose to go and attend these schools and their success stories and uh, closing these schools um, is wrong-headed. So I, again, thank you to everyone and I think this is a, at the point